So in the last lecture, we introduced the equation that the pressure within a fluid or a column of fluid, P, is equal to the pressure at the top of the column of fluid, P0, which is often atmospheric pressure, plus rho GD, where rho is the density of the fluid, G is the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared, and D is the height of the column of fluid that is above the point. So we introduced this equation last time, and today I'd like to talk about a couple of applications or implications of this equation. Now one implication of the equation is that the depth of the fluid, or the height of the column of fluid above the point of interest, is what really determines that pressure difference, um, which we call P minus P naught. So this is true regardless of the shape of the container. You can see here, this is a really common picture of a common physics demo um, right here, where you have these um, uh, connected containers, and the containers have all kinds of different shapes. Um, but what you can see is that when you pour fluid into the container, that if you hold it horizontally, and there's nothing else going on, that the fluid rises to the same horizontal level in each one of these containers. And that's regardless of the shape of the container. You can see you've got kind of a fat container here, and a squiggly container here, and a container with some bulbs in it right here, and then a long skinny one. And in all of those different containers, the fluid reaches the same height. Okay, And so we can remember that um, what this means is that the pressure is the same at all points on a horizontal line through a connected liquid in hydrostatic equilibrium. And that's why the fluid reaches the same height in each one of those things, because at the point where the liquid is, that's where it has to meet atmospheric pressure. And so that's the height there, and you can draw it across, and it'll fill up to that height. And as you go down into the container, if you drew a horizontal line across the container at the same distance from the table here, all the way across, the point um, inside that fluid would be the same pressure in, um, as you moved horizontally across, okay, within the fluid. So it would be the same in all those cases. Now, of course, the pressure would be greater in the middle of the fluid than it would be here at the top of the fluid by the amount rho GD. That's our pressure difference. But what we're saying here is that the pressure difference would be the same across a horizontal line through all the containers, regardless of the funky shape of the container. So that's one point, okay? Now, there's also uh, Pascal's principle, what became known as Pascal's principle. And here's a picture of the great man himself right here. And that is that any change in the pressure, here that's that delta P, P minus P naught, any change in the pressure applied to a completely enclosed fluid is going to be transmitted undiminished to all parts of the fluid and the enclosing walls. So if you apply an excess pressure to a fluid, perhaps by pushing down on a piston or your heart, for example, when it pumps, then that pressure is transferred to all of the fluid within the container. So when your heart pumps, for example, um, the change in the blood pressure is transmitted all throughout your body, okay, all throughout the fluid. Now these two ideas form the basis of a lot of different applications, like pressure gauges, hydraulic lifts and brakes, and as we already discussed, blood pressure. So how do we measure pressure? Well, there's a bunch of different kinds of pressure gauges, okay? They have different names. Uh, the one that's pictured here is an image of a mercury barometer. And in a barometer, you have a glass tube that um, is enclosed that you then upend into a dish or a container that contains the same fluid, okay? And so that's one way of measuring the pressure. And then you measure the height of the column of the fluid in the enclosed tube. And you can either have a very low density gas up here or a vacuum, um, and then you can measure the pressure. Now remember, one atmosphere of pressure is 1.013 times 10 to the fifth pascals. And a couple of the units of pressure, for example, um, like millimeters of mercury, come from the, the common pressure gauges that are used to measure them. And so, for example, one atmosphere of pressure corresponds to a height in many common pressure gauges of 760 millimeters of mercury, and mercury would be the fluid that they use to fill that tube. So that's where the name of the pressure gauge comes from. It comes from the liquid um, that's used to measure it and how tall that column gets in a barometer.
Now most pressure gauges measure the pressure above the atmospheric pressure and this is called the gauge pressure. So for example if you're measuring the pressure of air in your tire you might measure a pressure of uh, I don't know 20 psi or 30 psi in a bicycle tire. Now that's in addition to the 14.7 pounds per square inch that already exist outside. So the true pressure, if you measure 20, 20 psi, for example, the true pressure inside the tire is 34.7 psi, for example, because you'd want to add atmospheric pressure on it. But the reason that they do that is because, of course, we don't care about atmospheric pressure within our tire. Of course, our tire has at least one atmosphere of pressure in it. We want to know what the overpressure is because that's the important thing for making sure that our tire's not flat, right? Okay, so if you're given a gauge pressure and you need to calculate the absolute pressure, all you do is to um, subtract or add one atmosphere depending upon which way you're going. So if here the absolute pressure is P and you want to get the gauge pressure, then P sub G, the gauge pressure, would be equal to the absolute pressure minus one atmosphere. And then if you need it the other way, you can just add one atmosphere to the other side. Okay, now we already talked about blood pressure. Let's talk about it a little bit more. Common units for measuring blood pressure is in millimeters of mercury. So you might have heard a doctor tell you that your blood pressure is something like 120 over 70. Okay, so what that means is 120 millimeters of mercury over 70 millimeters of mercury. Now, of course, this is a gauge pressure, so this is above atmospheric pressure, okay? And as we've already discussed, one atmosphere of pressure in millimeters of mercury would be 760 millimeters of mercury. So the 120 actually means 880 millimeters of mercury because your blood pressure is higher than atmospheric pressure, okay? Now, there's two numbers that they report in a blood pressure. They usually report it as 120 over 70. So the first number is the maximum pressure that is experienced um, in your arteries and your heart. And that's the systolic pressure. Okay, so the maximum is the systolic. And the second number is the minimum pressure, and that's the diastolic pressure. Okay? So what happens is your heart contracts and that increases the pressure of the um, fluid in the system, in this case your blood. And so it goes up to its maximum, okay? So the pressure is going to increase as blood flows into your aorta as the heart contracts. And then you get your maximum. And then after that, the, um, the aortic valve closes and the pressure begins to drop off again as the blood flows through your system. Now you can measure this um, on different places in your arm. For example, in a blood pressure cuff, they can put it on your arm and they can measure it there by squeezing. And that's because it, when you, it, it's Pascal's principle, when you cause a change in pressure at one point in the fluid in the system, that pressure change is transmitted throughout the fluid, throughout the system. So even though your arm isn't your heart, you can still put the blood pressure cuff on your arm and read that change in pressure because the change in pressure is transmitted throughout your system. Okay. Now, um, getting back to different kinds of pressure gauges, we talked about the barometer, but there's a different, um, a whole bunch of different types of pressure, pressure gauges. This one that's pictured here is an open tube manometer, um, and so what you have here is um, on the right hand side here, you've got the pressure being measured, okay? So you'd hook it up to a chamber, a vacuum chamber, or whatever other kind of thing if you want to measure an overpressure of gas, you hook it up there. So that's, that's where you're measuring the pressure. And then um, you have a tube that runs through. The tube has liquid in it, oftentimes mercury. Um, other fluids could be used though, okay? So what happens is you measure the height difference between the right and the left hand sides of the column. So for example, if you have an overpressure, a high pressure, on the right hand side where you're measuring the pressure, that's going to push the fluid down and it'll raise the height of fluid of the column on the other side. And you measure that delta H and you record what the pressure is that corresponds to that delta H, okay? And then of course on the left hand side, the tube would be open at the end and it would be open to the atmospheric pressure. Um, there's other ways to do it. A common tire pressure gauge, for example, just uses the compression of a, um, a spring. So, for example, you have a piston hooked up to a spring, and then the spring contracts when it's um, 
when air is forced into there, there's air pressure that pushes on that piston and it causes the spring to contract. You measure the contraction of the spring. If you know the spring constant, then you know the force, and from the force you can calculate the pressure because you know the area of your little piston. And so that's another way to measure the pressure. You can also use um, something like an aneroid gauge here. Um, that's used mainly for air pressure where you have a flexible chamber that would then expand or contract depending upon the changes in pressure, and then that would move the indicator, the expansion and contraction of the, uh, of the container. Okay, back to the barometer. This is a mercury barometer, and it was developed by Torricelli, and that's where we get our pressure unit, the Tor, okay? Um, so Torricelli developed this to measure atmospheric pressure, and so yet again, it's a container, a closed container that's filled with the liquid, and then the container is open on the bottom, and it's suspended, the open end is suspended in a pool of the fluid, okay? And so what happens as the uh, pressure outside, uh, the atmospheric pressure fluctuates due to changes in weather or altitude or what have you, then um, that causes the column of fluid within the, the tube to rise and fall. And so you can detect changes in the atmospheric pressure using a barometer, okay? Now, if the pressure in the tube is, um, or I'm sorry, if the atmospheric pressure is exactly one atmosphere of pressure, then when you read off the column, the height of that column, and when I say the height of the column, I mean the height that the fluid rises to in the tube above the pool, above the line where it intersects the pool, okay? If you measure that, then it's 76 centimeters or 760 millimeters height of the column at one atmospheric pressure, one atmosphere of pressure. And that's why both the Tor and um, millimeters millimeters of mercury kind of match up, right? It's named in his honor after Torricelli who invented it. So 760 Tor is 760 millimeters of mercury is one atmosphere of pressure, okay? So we often quote it that way. Now any liquid can serve in a Torricelli style barometer, um, but dense liquids are actually more convenient. This barometer, for example, pictured in this little um, uh, sketch, it used water, and you can see that it's it's pretty tall, okay? Um, so how high, for example, would you have to have the level of the liquid if you were going to use something like alcohol? So for example, um, if you take your temperature with a glass thermometer, you uh, have an alcohol in there that's been dyed red. So why can't we use alcohol? Why mercury? Because mercury is actually, you know, poisonous and maybe not so safe to use. So couldn't we use something a little more safe, like alcohol? Well, the column, uh, the height of the column is dictated in part by the, um, the density of the fluid, okay? So what we can do is we can set the pressure equal to rho GD, okay? And that indicates how tall the column has to be. So one atmosphere of pressure is 1.013 times 10 to the fifth pascals. If you set that equal to rho GD, where rho is the density of the fluid, G is 9.8 meters per second squared, and D is the height of your column, then we can use a common uh, density for alcohol, which is 789 kilograms per cubic meter, G 9.8, and calculate D, and D would be 13.1 meters. So that's really tall, okay, um, 40 feet or so, and that's why we use mercury. Its density is 13.56 kilograms per cubic meter, I'm sorry, 13,560 kilograms per cubic meter, that's a little typo right there, and so because it's so much larger than the density of alcohol or water, then you can have a much smaller column of fluid to measure the pressure, and that's why we use mercury. Now some other applications of Pascal's principle and the um, equation P minus P naught is equal to rho GD is Pascal's principle, um, using Pascal's principle. So if an external pressure is applied to a confined fluid, then the pressure at every point within the fluid increases by that amount. And this is exploited to mechanical advantage in certain situations. For example, hydraulic lifts and hydraulic brakes exploit that. In hydraulic brakes, let's talk about that one first. You're inside a car, you push on the uh, brake pedal, and then what that does is it compresses eventually a cylinder, and the cylinder is part of a closed system where um, it has brake fluid in there, 
So when you compress the uh, push down on the piston, that increases the pressure throughout the system, increases the pressure in the brake fluid. Then that increase in pressure pushes on pistons at the other end, okay, um, near the brakes. You have a disc here, and then the fluid pushes down on the pistons on the other side, and then that contacts the disc. You have some brake pads in there so that you don't get extreme wear on your metal parts, um, and that holds the disc, applies friction to the disc, which slows and stops your car. So that's um, hydraulic brakes. Now, uh, in a hydraulic lift, we're going to talk more about that here, what happens is you have usually some kind of oil within the system, and you have a tiny little piston on one side where you're applying a force, and on the other side you have a very large piston, and you can put things like cars um, to, to lift the car up so that you can work on the underside of the car. You can put something like a car on top of the large piston and lift it up. Now, talking about this a little bit more, let's compare what's going on at the left and the right-hand side. So if we consider the point where the little piston and the big piston are at the same height, and we understand that the pressure throughout the system, the pressure on the brake fluid is the same, right? Um, when you change a, uh, I'm sorry, the, the change in pressure throughout the brake fluid is the same. So when you apply a force downward on here, that delta P is applied throughout the whole system and increases um, the pressure throughout the system, okay? So let's say that on this side, that um, wh where they're at the same height, that you apply a smaller force on the left-hand side to the small piston, okay? So you have a smaller force and a smaller area. And since they're at the same height, the pressure of the piston and the pressure of the cap on the other side, those two things have to be equal. So you have F1 over A1 and F2 over A2. Remember that when you draw a horizontal line across, right, the pressures have to be the same for the column of the fluid at that horizontal line. That's what I mean when I say the pressures have to be the same. So F1 over A1 on the left with a little piston has to equal F2 over A2 on the right because remember, the size of the container is unimportant. It's only the height of the fluid column, right? So you have F1 over A1 equals F2 over A2, and those two things must be equal. Well, you can rearrange that equation, and you have A2 over A1 equals F2 over F1, and that's called the mechanical advantage. So the ratio of the size of the areas of the two pistons lets you know how much more force can be supplied on the right-hand side than the left-hand side, right? So, for example, if the pressures have to be equal, then remember pressure is force over an area, so a little area, okay, um, would mean that your pressure is higher for the same force. So what that means is if the ratio has to be the same, then if you have a little area, you have to supply less force. Well, that gives you a mechanical advantage. You can supply less force to the left-hand side and get a larger force on the right-hand side, a force, for example, that would enable you to pick up a car, and that gives you a mechanical advantage. So the ratio of those areas is called your mechanical advantage. Let's do an example problem with this. So if you have a max gauge pressure in a hydraulic lift of 20 atmospheres, then what would be the largest mass vehicle that thing could lift if the diameter of the output line was 30 centimeters? Now, let's say that the diameter of the input line is 3 centimeters. What's the force required at the input to lift the car? Okay, so let's take this step by step. The pressure supplied by the lift via the hydraulic fluid has to equal the pressure from the car's weight on that output piston. Otherwise, it's not going to lift the car, okay? So let's take that 20 atmospheres <coughs> and put it in SI units. So to convert atmospheres to pascals, you have to multiply by 1.013 times 10 to the fifth pascals. Now, that pressure has to equal the pressure on the piston, which would be the weight of the car, mg, divided by the area of the piston. So that's the mass times 9.8 meters per second squared divided by the piston's area. Now the tricky thing here is that it supplied you the diameter of the line, so you have to have the diameter and get the radius, and then you do pi r squared to get the area. So you have um, m times 9.8 divided by pi times 0.15 meters squared. So if you solve for that, if you solve for the mass, you get about 14,600 kilograms, just keeping three significant figures. Now we can also solve for the second part of the question, which asks, 
about how much force is required at the input line to lift the car. And we can do that by finding the mechanical advantage. So the ratio of the areas of the output over the input, A2 over A1, is going to give us that mechanical advantage. So pi times 0.15 meters squared divided by pi times 0.015 meters squared gives you 100. So in this situation, you would have a mechanical advantage of 100. So if the mechanical advantage is 100, then the uh, force that's required to lift it will be about 1 one hundredth of the, for of the weight of the car. And so 14,600 kilograms times 9.8 is the weight of the car, so we can figure out what F1 would be, the force required to lift that car, and it would be 1,430 newtons. Okay? I hope that's clear. If not, make sure to pause the video and give it a little bit of thought while you stare at it. I find that helps a lot. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. <clears throat> Remember that this is a continuation of the first lecture, which introduces the equation P minus P naught is equal to rho GD. So if you haven't seen that one, you'll probably want to go back and watch it so you can fully understand all the implications of that equation that were discussed in this lecture. And I'll see you in class.